Please turn with me in God's Word to the Gospel of Luke, Luke chapter 4. We remember that at the beginning of the Gospel of Luke, Luke says that he went and did some research. He studied well. He used sources, people who were still alive. He was, of course, also an understudy of the Apostle Paul as Luke traveled everywhere with Paul. And so what Luke has written here he has compiled as the Word of God. And we find uh, our text uh, from verse 38 to 44. Then he got up and left the synagogue and entered Simon's home. Now Simon's mother-in-law was suffering from a high fever and they asked him to help her. And standing over her, he rebuked the fever and it left her. And she immediately got up and waited on them. While the sun was setting, all those who had any who were sick with various diseases brought them to him. And laying his hands on each one of them, he was healing them. Demons also were coming out of many, shouting, You are the Son of God. But rebuking them, he would not allow them to speak, because they knew him to be the Christ. When day came, Jesus left and went to a secluded place. And the crowds were searching for him and came to him and tried to keep him from going away from them. But he said to them, I must preach the kingdom of God to the other cities also, for I was sent for this purpose. So he kept on preaching in the synagogues of Judea. Now you might want to look at the footnote here at Judea. Of course, Judea, the Hebrew word for Judea is Yehuda, and it can simply mean the synagogues of the Jews. Not so much Judea, but the synagogues of the Jews, because Mark in his gospel tells us that Jesus kept on preaching in the synagogues of Galilee. My brother and sister, as said, we have just heard the Word of God, a Word which directs people, which rebukes people, which draws people closer to God, comforts people, and strengthens them. And we take His Word as such. Congregation of our Lord Jesus Christ, the four verses before our text verses that I preached on six weeks ago, describe how our Lord taught in a synagogue in Capernaum and how in that synagogue He expelled a demon from a demon-possessed man. Well, gauging from our text for this morning, it is still that same day. Yes, it's still that same Sabbath. And from that synagogue where Jesus had taught and expelled that demon, he went straight to the home of Simon Peter. I had the privilege of standing there, at least on the floor of that house. It seems quite a few people lived in that house, at least Simon Peter with his wife. Yes, some disciples had wives. And also Peter's wife's mother was there. And also Andrew, Peter's brother. Well, from what happens there in Peter's house, you and I get another chance to look at our Lord, and to see His power, to see His love, His compassion, 
and his faithfulness to his calling, we also see again his identity revealed. Now you and I, being mere human beings, we can never be 100% like Jesus. However, the more and more you and I live lives surrendered to Jesus Christ, the more and more we will display some of the qualities of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so the sermon has three points. Compassionate, sharing, and then the question, why miracles? Firstly then, compassionate. From our text and from its parallels in Mark and Matthew and John, we understand that as soon as Jesus entered Peter's house, he saw that Peter's mother-in-law was lying sick, suffering from a fever. In fact, in verse 38, Dr. Luke, because he was a doctor, tells us it was a high fever. Well, you and I know that it's quite normal for children to have high fevers, scary ones too. But when adults have fevers, let alone high ones, they are usually very sick and miserable. So Peter and those of his house asked Jesus about her. Then we are told that Jesus went and he stood over her probably in a way that he was leaning over her and taking her hand, as Mark says, and lifting her up while he rebuked the fever. How strange it sounds that something which is not a person, yes, a fever, is rebuked. But you and I must understand that whatever the reason for the fever, whether a virus or whether bacteria, the Lord of the universe has the power to rebuke and command even these things. And then we read that she immediately got up. And look, is it not the instantaneous response to Jesus' healing command, which testifies to the fact that this was a miracle. It does not happen every day. It's above natural. It's supernatural. What's more, she was fully cured. We don't hear her say, my fever is gone, but oh, I still feel completely exhausted. No, nothing of the sort. One minute before Jesus took her by the hand and rebuked the fever, this mother-in-law was still red hot with fever and flushed cheeks, with burning hot skin, with lots of sweating, perhaps even shivering. But the next minute, every fever symptom had vanished. Not the slightest fatigue. And now she's even serving them. Clearly a miracle. The news of this miracle spread like hotcakes through the whole town. So many people who had sicknesses and something wrong with them waited till just before sunset when the Sabbath was considered to be over. And then they were all brought to the door of Simon Peter's house. And Jesus, because of his love and compassion, denied none of them. No, verse 40 confirms, and laying his hand on each one of them, he was healing them. 
And they came not just with fevers, like the mother-in-law. No, verse 40 tells us they came with various illnesses. In other words, there was no room to suspect that Jesus' healing power was restricted to just one kind of disease. No, he had a remedy for every malady. And there again, at Peter's front door, just as earlier that day in the synagogue, he also drove demons out of some people. Now, last time we talked about the, the demons. Uh, it sounds strange in the 21st century to hear of demons. But allow me to remind us all of what was said in the previous sermon. There has never been a period in human history when the demonic world was more actively at work and furiously engaged against the kingdom of God than in the first century. Why? Well, because the Son of God was walking on this earth and all the power of hell was unleashed against them. Because Satan's battle ultimately is against God. Well, verse 41 says that as Christ was expelling these demons, they cried, You are the Son of God. But he rebuked them, man, and he would not allow them to speak. Why would Christ not allow them to speak the truth? Verse 41 also gives an answer. It says, because they knew that he was the Christ. Well, is that not what he wanted them to say? Was it then bad that they knew that Jesus was the long-expected anointed one, the Messiah, the Christ? Yes, it was bad that these demons were here right at the start of Jesus' ministry, shouting out, out his identity so that all could hear. Yes, because if the people heard that Jesus was indeed a long-awaited Messiah, they might want to make him king on their terms. Not just that, but if Jesus' enemies would see the king-making crowd, they would want to kill Jesus. Yes, killing him before his God-ordained time. Well, how blessed was Peter's house that day. Not just mother-in-law instantly recovered, but all of Capernaum's sick found healing at Peter's front door through Jesus' powerful love and compassion. They found healing even from Satan's powers over them. Indeed, how blessed was Peter's house that day, and how blessed still today every house which received Christ. For so true, also for you and me, are the words of Matthew Henry. Those that bid him welcome into their hearts and houses shall be no losers by him. He comes with healing. And with that, we mean more than physical healing. He could, if he wanted to do that, we mean spiritual healing, peace and sanity. Why? Because he or she, yes, the whole family, who truly receives Jesus in their hearts, will be changed by him. They will want to live and enjoy living on his terms and for his glory. Terms that will bring them all healing. 
is, as the following poem says, happy the home where God is there and love fills every breast. When one their wish and one their prayer and one their heavenly rest. My brother and sister, our Lord's sympathy, his empathy, yes, his compassion was and is deep. It's effective. It's personal to everyone who comes to him. His compassion. Well, is it not true that he or she who has really received Jesus on his terms and for his glory will want to be like Jesus? Yes, I know you and I will never be exactly and completely like Jesus, but is it not so that he or she who has tasted Christ's kind compassion will also want to show Christ-like compassion. Is that not why even Peter's mother-in-law, having tasted Christ's compassion, immediately got up and not sat still? She served him and the rest with kindness, thankfulness, compassion. I love the words of the popular Christian song, I want to be like Jesus. Here are just a few words from that song. I have one deep, supreme desire that I may be like Jesus. To that I fervently aspire that I may be like Jesus. Well, Jesus was and is many things. But looking at point one of the sermon, I pray that you and I will daily aspire to be compassionate as our Lord is compassionate. We come to point two, sharing. Looking at verse 42 and also at the parallel passage in the Gospel of Mark, our Lord now needed to be alone with his Father in prayer. So he rose while it was still dark, and he left when day came to a secluded place. What a good rule for all busy people to follow. Break regularly for recuperation and Prayer with your heavenly Father, not just for laziness, but for prayer with your heavenly Father. But our Lord's special time would not last long, for Mark and Luke tell us that Peter and the crowds came looking for him. And so thrilled were they were with his performance of the previous day, and so scared were they that they had lost him when they woke up and they saw he was gone, that they went and looked for him. And now that they have found him, they will try to keep him from ever going away again from them. You see, these people thought that in order to enjoy God's gift, they must keep these gifts and Jesus all to themselves. In this, they were no different to many others right through the ages and today who want to keep Jesus just for themselves. Well, are not people who keep Christ just for themselves like the Dead Sea compared to the Sea of Galilee? Yes, the Sea of Galilee is fresh and vibrant because it passes on to the south the refreshing waters which flow into it and have fled into it from the north. But the Dead Sea just keeps on receiving its waters, receiving and receiving it from the Jordan, not letting it out. 
Thus, it has become and remains stagnant and dead. But that's not what Christ's heart is like. No, for he straightway corrects these selfish Christ restrainers and saying to them, I must preach the kingdom of God to the other cities also, for I was sent for this purpose. Indeed, Jesus understood his purpose and calling. God triune had called him for the purpose of preaching the good news of the kingdom of God to all the world, starting, of course, as verse 44 says, with the preaching in all the synagogues of the Jews. What is the good news of the kingdom of God? Well, that eventually God will bring a fully redeemed universe in which every human being who has by grace through faith received God through Jesus Christ will be forever at home with him. But as Jesus was proclaiming this good news with power and compassion, and still even in our day, the kingdom of God was and is in an already but not yet state. Yes, the kingdom of God, which started off like a small mustard seed, is currently still growing and growing. And the day of the final realization of this kingdom is always getting closer and closer and closer. And knowing this and longing for this, all who love Jesus, keep on praying. Thy kingdom come, and thy will be done on earth, just as it is in heaven. And yet, all who love Jesus will not just be praying. No, they will, like their Lord, always be aware of the purpose of God, and that is to share Christ with others. He is not selfishly holding him just for themselves. Granted, you and I cannot all be full-time missionaries, yet everyone who loves Jesus is called to, with word and deed, preach the good news of the kingdom of God right there where we are. To that end, you and I are at times exhorted by hymns like this one, by Francis Havergal. Lord, speak to me that I may speak. Here is stanza two. Oh, teach me, Lord, that I may teach the precious things thou dost impart, and wing my words that they may reach the hidden depths of many a heart. That was point two, sharing. We come to the last point. Miracles. Why miracles? My brother and sister, our text has shown us that Jesus performed many miracle, miracles of various kinds. The question now is, why did he perform miracles? You know, I have once asked even a Jewish rabbi, do you know of any rabbi at the time of Jesus who was healing also, not just preaching? They have to shake their head. There was none. So the first reason which could be given is indeed that which we have already given under point one, that Jesus was and is compassionate. He's filled with love and care for the sick and suffering who came to him. Of course, this is a very good reason for his miracles, but his compassion, moving as it is, that's not the ultimate reason for the miracles. So what then was the reason 
for Jesus' miracles? Was it to prove the existence of God? No. For anyone who is honest with him or herself will be able to, by mere observation of this wonderful creation, think and conclude that God does exist. As Romans 1 verse 20 says, For God's invisible attributes have clearly been perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. So if Jesus' miracles were they not so much to show his, his compassion, neither to prove the existence of God, what was then their purpose? Well, did you know that nowhere does the New Testament use the word miracle? Yes, in our English translations we may read that Jesus performed miracle. But the Greek text always uses one of the following four words. Works, wonders, powers, and signs, of which signs is the one mostly used. In other words, each one of Jesus' miracles really acted like a sign which pointed to a reality greater than that sign. Yes, to a reality of even greater significance. And what was the greater significance to which Christ's miracles were pointing? Well, they were pointing to the fact that Jesus was operating by God's authority and so to a large extent, the signs which Jesus performed had the same task as the signs which every Old Testament prophet who could heal performed. These signs were saying, this prophet is not just preaching by his own authority, but by God's authority. And this was the case with sign performing Elijah, Elisha, and Moses, my brother and sister, remember how Moses answered God when God commanded him to go back from Midian to Egypt to lead God's people out? Exodus 4 verse 1, then Moses answered, but behold, Lord, they will not believe me or, or listen to my voice, for they will say, the Lord did not appear to you. And what did the Lord then give Moses so that the people would believe that he was really sent by God himself? Well, the Lord then gave Moses signs. Exodus 4 verse 2 and following, the Lord said to Moses, what is that in your right hand? Moses said, staff. And God said, throw it on the ground. So he threw it on the ground and it became a serpent. And Moses ran from it. But the Lord said to Moses, put out your hand and catch it by the tail. So he put out his hand and caught it. And it became a staff again in his hand. Then the Lord said these important words of Exodus 4 verse 5, that they may believe that the Lord, the God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has appeared to you. That's why I give you these signs. Well then, in case one sign would not be enough to convince the Israelites and Pharaoh that Moses came by God's orders, God told Moses again in verse 6, put your hand inside your cloak. And you know the story, how his hand came out leprous. And the Lord says, put it back in again. And now pull it out. And it was healed. And then we read in verse 8, if they will not believe you, God said, or listen to the first 
sign. They may believe the latter sign. Thus, every time Moses would perform these signs, yes, every time Moses would turn his staff into a snake which would swallow up the snakes that the Egyptians created by mere optical illusionary tricks, then Moses' real and superior miracle served as a sign, attesting to the divine command by which Moses operated. The same is true just on a higher level for Jesus who came as the Son of God. Yes, every miracle Jesus performed, although the miracle had no mouth or tongue to speak, was boldly saying, this man, Jesus, is operating by God's own authority. His miracles are signs supporting his preached words, words that say that he is the Son of God. So believe in him for your salvation. Thus, Jesus' miracles were attestations of who he was and is. My brother and sister, is it now a wonder that the Apostle John writes in John 20, verse 30 and 31, now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in His name. Why do we, church family, blessed is every one of you who sees the signs Jesus performed in our text. Yes, blessed are you if you then believe Jesus because of the signs that he is the Son of God. Blessed are you too if you and I, moved by Jesus, go share him in words and in deeds of Christ-like compassion. Amen.